So the studies around Alzheimer's and cognitive function say you should have some fish oil, but not too much. And there are people who are, I'm gonna say fish oil fetishists right now. It can cause your blood to be too thin. It probably increases cancer risk when you're taking way too much for long periods of time because it's unstable, just like the other omega-6 oils. Our guest today is a four-time New York Times bestselling author and host of an award-winning top 100 podcast, The Human Upgrade, and he's considered to be the father of the modern biohacking movement. Dave Asprey is on a mission to empower and enable people to lead happier, more conscious lives by using biohacking techniques and technology to improve the functioning and destiny of the body and mind. You are obviously iconic when it comes to the conversation of longevity. Oh, thanks. And for me, being a nutritionist, food is a big deal. You know, Hell it makes yeah. up every cell of our bodies, the energy substrate to, to fuel this incredible organism. And I wanna ask you about some foods that are correlated with a longer lifespan. And because I know you know, yep. let's go through five foods that have the potential to extend our lifespan. All right. One of them, grass-fed butter could extend your lifespan. And this has been my predominant source of fat, has been either animal fat or dairy fat and a tablespoon or two of olive oil for about 15 years, maybe some avocados here and there. And the reason you do that is saturated fats build your hormones and you need to maintain young hormone levels as you age. And they do not cause heart disease. They're stable oils and it's canola oil and soybean oil and safflower and even the fake avocado oil everywhere that's causing problems. So I avoid those and I eat the saturated fat from butter. All There's right. also- Before you go okay. on, so you said fake avocado oil. What do you oh, mean yeah. by that? Well, a recent study just came out and it said that something like 80% of the avocado oil that you can buy is actually canola oil or another oil that's cut in with it or it's rancid and oxidized. So it's hard to make good quality avocado oil and they're gonna take the avocados that are the ones they couldn't sell you to make avocado oil. So just like olive oil, they're selling more avocado oil than we could produce. So you know a lot of it's fake. And they can of course put the little tagline with avocado oil, Yeah, the little health washing scheme. Oh yeah. And you also mentioned that these fats help to build our hormones. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about that? This is a really big deal. There's only one saturated fat your body makes on its own. It's palmitic acid, which is a saturated fat. So some people, maybe after having been bribed by the seed oil industry, are saying, oh no, saturated fats are good for you, but your body makes it because you need it. And that kind of flies in the face of logic. <laughs> so cholesterol, which your body can manufacture from saturated fats, it is the building block for your stress hormones, which you need to handle stress, and your sex hormones, which you need to feel motivation in your life. So if you're low on testosterone or estrogen or progesterone, then you just feel like you can't do it and you don't wanna do it. And it's okay to stay in grandma's basement and play video games. And all of a sudden, if you get your testosterone levels up because you're eating steak and eggs and butter and things like that, then you're saying, wow, Funny enough, I have motivation, and the motivation comes from dopamine. Dopamine is the motivation chemical, and it rides with testosterone. Most people today, men and women, are very low on testosterone because of crap in our food and crap in our air and even in our skin care and our cleaning products and things like that. So if you're in your 20s and your testosterone is around 500, those are grandpa levels. Those are not okay for a 20 year old. This is the time you should be out there claiming your place in life, finding your partner and building your career, building your life, building your community. And instead, oh God, I'm just so tired, I'm so anxious. You're just low dopamine because you're low testosterone because you're eating seed oils, because you're eating a lot of ultra processed carbs, because you're getting junk light by staring at bright screens till two in the morning. And you're not eating the foods that are necessary for human thriving. And yeah, that's butter. And I stand by that because when you look at all the research, let's see, what's been happening recently? They're finding out that dairy fat is good for you in lots of studies. Dairy protein is a mixed bag. And then you look at traditional cultures. Let's see, when India, which is largely but not entirely vegetarian, when they ate a lot of dairy fat, ghee is clarified butter. I made ghee famous in the US by putting it in coffee. Well, they didn't have all this diabetes, all this heart attack. 
stuff. It was only when American companies came to India and then we convinced them to get rid of their traditional oils to have healthy vegetable oil and charge them more for it that obesity skyrocketed. So we know that it's seed oils that are causing diabetes and even cancer. And there are other causes of those, but they are primary causes that make the cell membranes weaker. We can fix that. And the deal is don't eat it if it's fried at a restaurant. There's a few restaurants that'll use a cultured oil, which is all monounsaturated, and a few that will use beef tallow. So if you want a beef tallow French fry, if you can find it, great. Every McDonald's had beef tallow French fries until the 70s. So this idea of cutting costs to, to save money on food, the last place where you should economize is on the quality of your food. You can still eat on a budget and you allocate just a tiny bit more for quality. And instead of buying margarine, you buy butter. Maybe it's not grass-fed, it's still better. And the grass-fed butter is a dollar more. And that dollar, you go to Starbucks twice a week, you can afford you know a lot of butter for that. Mm -hmm. And if you even think about how easy it is to make butter, you know, the ingredients required, the processing required versus something like canola oil, you see which oh, yeah. one is closer to a whole real food <laughs> versus something that's ultra, ultra processed. In fact, you can't eat canola oil. It's called rapeseed and it makes humans and animals sick if you eat it. So what we used to do was squeeze the oil out of these rapeseeds and then we would use it as lubricant in machines because it was better than whale oil or something, you know? <laughs> and someone figured out, oh, well, if we bleach it and refine it and do all these other things that oxidize it, it's palatable. That means it tastes good, but that doesn't mean it's good for you because they don't care. They don't care if it's cheap and whether you'll eat it. And then instead of making it healthy, which might take research and innovation and investment, like, well, we'll just pay a marketing guy to tell you it's good for you. And maybe we'll bribe a few government entities to put it in a pyramid that's based on economics. So we have this food pyramid that's upside down entirely. Um, I, uh, I have been doing this butter thing. I also eat a lot of red meat on purpose and it's part of my longevity strategy. And there are people out there who will say, you have to be vegan or somehow plant-based for longevity. It's nonsense. Uh, right now, my friend, Brian Johnson, um, who's done the longevity uh, Olympics he's doing, which is how rapidly can you reverse your aging? Um, he's tracking on his leaderboard, the rate of aging. And he spends about $2 million a year. And he is almost vegan, although he eats 20 grams of beef collagen every day, which is definitely not vegan. But I'm doing 200 grams of protein. That's all animal protein every day. I have exactly the same rate of aging. It's 72%. And, and there are studies that support high quality protein is necessary uh, even for longevity. So this, this weird blip in all of recorded history where we're somehow eating malnutrition diets that would normally be reserved for the lowest class peasants. And we're trying to tell ourselves that's gonna make us live longer. It's not, it depletes your minerals. It depletes your hormones, it messes with your thyroid. And I say this as a former vegan and a former raw vegan who's really devout until I started shattering teeth and getting autoimmune issues. This is why 80% of people who fall for the propaganda from PETA and other groups, they, with good intentions, attempt a plant-based diet and they look down one day and like, I can't get an erection. I have love handles I didn't have. My joints hurt all the time. I have floaters in my eyes and I hate my life and I probably hate my friends because I lost my dopamine, then they quit. 80% of vegans quit being vegan because it makes you sick. And you have to be really, really stubborn like I am to stick with it for a couple of years <laughs> until it really punches you in the kidney because 70% of kidney stones are caused by plants, not meat. Isn't that weird? All right, there's two things here. <laughs> First of all, two things. So number one, that, and that statistic has been floating around for a while. The kidney stones? No, not that. <laughs> I dropped a few there. <laughs> right. But just the, the the transition, you know, somebody goes vegan and then transitioning away from that eventually. And oftentimes it's looked at, if you're in the vegan community, as a weakness. You just gave up. But before you yeah, say anything, before it. you say anything, understanding that the adherence to it is part of it, but also the potential mm -hmm. for many of us to develop some or many deficiencies. And I want to ask you specifically though, what about the people that can thrive on a vegan plant protocol who are 20 years vegan and they've been able to put on muscle mass and all these different things? Are they unicorns? Both of those people you mean? 
<laughs> oh my god <laughs> so there, there's like 10 exactly okay they're very very few and the fact that you can take someone who is capable of we're going to call it thriving on that diet and you just give them a steak and watch this ripple of power that emanates from like holy crap what have i been missing that's what's going on there and there are people like i interviewed Sadhguru, uh who's uh, a very, very advanced spiritual guru. And he says, you know, don't eat animals because, uh, you know, you'll absorb their energy and they'll take you out of your human energy. And I have a very advanced meditation practice. I've been to Nepal and Tibet and South America and learned from the masters. And I, I run a you know, neurofeedback meditation mystery school called 40 Years of Zen. So I'm, I'm into that stuff. And you can feel uh, the animals. So there's kind of three three things you look at for why you would be vegan. And one of them is say, I don't want to um, harm animals, but <laughs> it's like, this is for spiritual people who are bad at math because I grew up in, in farming country in the central Valley in California. And if you have almonds, which grew across the street from me, you also have shotguns and traps and you kill an awful lot of ground squirrels. Anything that's out there wants to eat your nuts. You kill everything that eats your nuts. You can't sell them. And if you have, you know, corn and soy, so you have some nice, you know, cruelty-free tofu, dude, those tractors come through and they chop everything, including baby deer, bunnies, turtles, rabbits, salamanders. Notice how I only pick the cute ones. There's a lot of ugly bugs that are really necessary for life. They get chopped up too. Oh, actually they don't because they've been killed by the pesticides that were sprayed. So the deaths per calorie from grains is absurd. And the deaths per calorie from grass-fed large animals, you can eat one cow for a whole year. And what I believe from a shamanic perspective and my own explorations of the ethics of this, domestic animals have an agreement with humans who call this a spiritual agreement between our species. And they come here to nourish us and we take care of them. And it, it's, it's actually very complete and it's a very spiritual circle. And I say this having built a regenerative farm with chickens and pigs and sheep and cows and looked them in the eye and fed them every morning and delivered their babies and all that kind of stuff. And when you do that right, they come here to experience gratitude and they're willing and able and happy to nourish us. And it is a crime to mistreat an animal, especially when you're butchering it or to mistreat animals the way we do. The answer is not to mistreat yourself by becoming vegan. The answer is to only eat ethically treated animals, which increases the number of farmers who will treat animals well. Otherwise, we'll create a world where we're all eating basically corn and soy and crickets, probably all run by Bill Gates. I don't want to live in that world. In fact, I'm not going to live in that world. So there are farmers. There are lots of farmers. You wouldn't know this if you're in the US, but right now across Europe, there are probably 50 to 100,000 farmers blocking roads in Germany and Denmark and France, spraying animal manure on their parliament buildings completely shutting down society because governments are trying to take over farms. So this is a, a call to number one, support farmers. Number two, support small distributed farmers. You want to know the guy who raised your cows. I promise you that if he raised those cows, he didn't treat them wrong. He stayed up all night because one of them got cut by barbed wire. And that's a fact of life. It, it's, it's, very, it's very spiritual and it's very humbling to live right next to animals and to see their lives and their cycle of life. This is what small farmers do. And this is what I've done for a decade on Vancouver Island. And so when people say it's unethical, like, guys, you're not paying attention. These animals are necessary for soil. They're necessary for the completeness of our biosphere. You want to pull carbon out of the air, have more poop. Like, that's what it takes. It needs to be cow poop or sheep poop. So we can do this and we have plenty of land to do it. We just need to spread it out. And it doesn't all need to be run by Tyson or some other big company. It's got to be run by you and me and families who say, you know, we're willing to work 20 hour days in spring when it's lambing season because it's the right thing to do for six weeks. And then we're going to watch these animals thrive and we're going to take their wool and we're going to make something out of it. And then we're going to eat the animals or make milk out of it. But when you do it, our sheep will walk to where they're being butchered because they know because we practice gratitude every day. And it's so different. So when someone says you have to eat only plants and malnourish yourself and have weaker children and become infertile, which is what happens when you're vegan because they deplete your minerals. It's not okay to treat humans that way. 
And it's not okay to take animals out of our existence, which is where that leads to. So the vegan philosophy is ultimately a death philosophy. They don't know it, but it is. It's either don't kill animals while you're killing more animals than someone who eats beef. Okay, that's a bad idea. I'm going to do it for my health. Well, except it doesn't make you healthy. This oxalic acid problem is causing more kidney stones than ever and gout and a bunch of other health problems and phytic acid that sucks minerals from your bones. You might break a hip when you're in your 20s. (laughs) And um, the third thing about uh, animal uh, animal cruelty or is it environmentalism? I'm forgetting which one I'm on. But uh, there's the environmental thing. You need animals to pull carbon out of the air. So you don't win environmentally. You don't win animal cruelty. And you don't even win on a health perspective. So the three reasons... They've all been created for a reason, and there's two forces doing that. One of them is, I'm just going to say religious radicals who've infiltrated our food recommendation system. This goes back to Kellogg and Post. Uh, You know, Reverend Kellogg was into forced enemas, circumcising boys and girls, and creating foods that lower testosterone, because if we would just stop masturbating, the world would be a better place. That's why you eat cornflakes, right? Maybe we can do better, is all I'm saying. And I think it's time we do better. And I know because my former wife, the mother of my children was infertile when I met her. And my first book, people don't know this, it was on how do you take care of yourself before you even get pregnant so that you can have healthier, stronger babies? Because I did not want to have kids as unhealthy as I was when I was a kid. And my kids are thriving and I'm so grateful for that. And I'll tell you, they eat a lot of steak. They don't eat a lot of soy burgers. In fact, they've never had a soy burger. They know better. Man, thank you for sharing your perspective on this. You did say a dirty C word earlier. I want to circle back to. Oh man, I'm like, which dirty C word was I talking about? Calorie? (laughs) Cholesterol. Oh yeah. Cholesterol. And you mentioned this being a building block of our sex hormones. There's so much misinformation about cholesterol. This is something our bodies literally make it because it's so important. Our liver can make some of it. But from a dietary perspective, this is something that we've been told to avoid. Mm. But when we're... And, and instead, of course, number <laughs> number one, but number two, let's bring in a statin on top of that. And what happens oh, when man. we're taking statins? Increase incidence of type two diabetes, muscle pain and weakness, more cancer, mitochondrial the harm. Goes on and on. It's it's really funny. Um, years ago, I had a conversation with my friend Nina Takeholtz. Do you know Nina? Uh, she's one of the the big researchers about fat quality and types of fat, and. We had just had a phone call about potentially filing a class action lawsuit against the American Heart Association because they kept promoting this, this just like the exact opposite of what worked. And it just, it was like, they're harming people and they're actually taking money to harm people. It was a few years ago. And I gave a talk in Malibu at a, a TV studio executive's house, you know, looking out over the water and there's some really, really big Hollywood names in. And I gave my full talk about cholesterol and thyroid and inflammation and how you need to have more saturated fat. And one of the people in the audience, she said, I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. And at the end of my talk, I said, well, what do you guys think? Got any questions? And she stands up, she goes, I'm the former president of the American Heart Association. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is gonna be fun. And, and I just looked at her and I said, I really want to know what you think about this. And she looked around the room and she goes, everything he said was right. I, I almost cried. I was like, like I was in this combative thing, like we're gonna have to stop it. And, and she said, two years ago, we announced that cholesterol is a nutrient of non-concern. She said, but no one will listen. We were wrong. We thought eating cholesterol raised cholesterol. We found out that wasn't true. And we told people that eating cholesterol isn't a problem. Now the AHA still says saturated fat's a problem and it doesn't look like that's actually true, at least for most people, but it might be for some. And so she just said, I want people to listen. Like cholesterol is not the problem. Eating an egg isn't a problem. And I just felt this wave of relief that, you know, there are good doctors, even at these large organizations, and most of them are corrupt. They, there's evidence now, it's all over the place, that the seed oil industry paid the regulatory um, or the private bodies like that, and so did Big Sugar. They've been manipulating us with media. And I wouldn't even call that misinformation. Misinformation is a very slippery word. It, it's like, oh, you're, you're, it almost has like a smarminess to it. like. You know, oh, that's that's misinformation. And the reality is there's truth, there's mistakes, and there's lies. 
And those are the only three things. Misinformation is you saying you know what's going on in someone else's head and that they're doing it with intent to, to deceive. So it's a way of sounding holier than thou. And so anytime someone talks about misinformation in anything, I just laugh. I'm like, oh, is it a lie or is it a mistake? And we know damned well that our regulatory agencies have been lying to us. They lie to you every time they say it's okay to spray glyphosate on the soil, knowing full well what it does, knowing that Bayer slash Monsanto uh, has been fined more than $10 billion for the harm caused by this, and they're still, still selling it and spraying it on our playgrounds and in our dog parks. It's wrong. And those people will be held accountable. All right, we're just at one on this list. Oh man, how do we get the glyphosate uh, from butter? This is very, very unusual. Is, but this is so powerful. You're opening up so many different aspects yeah. of this that we overlook. Um, so we've got butter slash ghee, number one. For longevity, you got butter and ghee. And by the way, olive oil, it's got a little asterisk there. One or two tablespoons a day of olive oil, tons of health benefits. Eating all olive oil, uh, there isn't a lot of evidence for that, except if you feed polyunsaturated, which is the seed oils, or monounsaturated to animals, they will hibernate. But if you feed them butter, they don't hibernate because polyunsaturated oils slow your metabolism the most. And the second most is monounsaturated. So an all monounsaturated diet is anti-metabolic, which you don't want to do. That said, olive oil is good for you. One of the biggest mistakes we make as human beings is it's really easy to shortcut our thinking. So if something is good, more is better. If something is bad, don't have any. And that means that you know, cortisol, oh, it's the stress death hormone. Yeah, low cortisol is more dangerous than high cortisol. It'll actually kill you faster. So maybe just the right amount. And it's not more good, less good. It's right amount good. And that's just a harder level of thinking. It requires more knowledge and more work to do that. Since we've pulled into the olive oil driveway, let's talk a little bit more about it. Why is right. this correlated with longevity, specifically olive oil? There are several theories about olive oil. One of them is the polyphenols, but you can get olive polyphenols in supplements without all of the fats, including the linoleic acid, which is the big problem in our diets today. Olive oil is about 14 to 16% linoleic acid, which is something that I don't choose to eat other than the 1.6% found in grass-fed beef fat. So you don't want to overdo that because you'll naturally raise your levels of omega-6 oils, which just isn't a good idea. The other reason that it's very likely good for you is a compound called hydroxytyrosol. And this is something you can buy. And it's something that actually, when I worked for Bulletproof, and by the way, I have nothing, no association at all with Bulletproof anymore. Danger Coffee is my new coffee company. So whatever Bulletproof is doing, I'm, I don't know what it is and I'm not accountable for it. <laughs> and... Um, hydroxytyrosol, when I was there, I put it into my krill oil formula because it's such a potent longevity compound. So if I can get as much hydroxytyrosol as 100 bottles of olive oil, I'll just do that in a capsule, thank you very much. It's like, I'm going to drink my red wine and take all the biological hits to get resveratrol, or I could get 1,000 bottles of red wine worth of resveratrol in a capsule. So it turns out with technology, we can concentrate some nutrients. And so for olive oil, it's a hydroxytyrosol and a polyphenol problem. You can get lots of polyphenols and lots of hydroxytyrosol for very cheap without having to overload yourself with olive oil. And I love high quality, good olive oil, and I use it every day. Just don't use it extensively. Got it. Now, moving on this list, are there any, just thinking about foods that we kind of gravitate towards. Even when I was a kid, I used to walked to, to school with my little cousin Candy and it was just a block away, but there was like a mulberry bush that was on our walk. And it's just like, we would pick the mulberries and eat. Are there any berries that are correlated with longevity? Blueberries are very highly correlated with mitochondrial health, with gut bacterial health, with brain function and with longevity. So blueberries are a real superfood. But there's some interesting nuances. And some of this we didn't know back when I first came out with the Bulletproof Diet. And that's my diet book. People lost a couple million pounds. You know, the first intermittent fasting, you put butter in your coffee kind of concept book. I talked about red raspberries because they have some really good polyphenols. But it turns out red raspberries are up there with spinach and actually a little bit ahead of kale even in the amount of oxalic acid they have. And so red raspberries probably are not correlated because they're gonna cause system-wide calcification of your tissues with tiny razor-sharp crystals 
called oxalic acid or cal calcium oxalate. And those are shown in studies to cause mitochondrial harm. And your mitochondria are the things you keep healthy if you want to live a long time. So raspberries, if you eat two raspberries in raspberry season, I don't care. If you do what I used to do when I was a vegan, was I'd eat a, a box or two of raspberries every day. And strangely, I had to pee 25 times a day. Literally, I went to several doctors and they put a camera in that hole in men that should never have anything go in it to see what's going on in my bladder. I'm still traumatized by that. And they didn't find anything. But... The number of women I've met who are eating beets, spinach, kale, almonds, and raspberries every day, and they say, oh, I have interstitial cystitis. It's been with me for years. I'm like, stop. And three days later, like, oh my God, my symptoms are gone. I'm like, yeah, you were forming little crystals in your urethra every single day because of your diet, your vegan, plant-based, healthy diet. It just doesn't work. Blueberries for the win. Blueberries for the win. So we've got butter <laughs> slash ghee, and we threw olive oil in there as well, a little bit on that. You got blueberries. What's another one? You know, another one, I, I'm just going to say animal protein on this one. And there's really two kinds of animal protein to pay attention to. One is ruminant animals, grass-fed ruminant animals. And this means cows and sheep. And if you're into it, goats, if you can find them where you live. And these have the most amount of minerals, the most micronutrients, and the best fatty acid ratio. And the other kind of animal-based protein would be wild-caught salmon, ideally sockeye. It's getting harder and harder to find clean fish, including sockeye, because the farmed Atlantic salmon is spreading parasites and viruses into wild populations of fish up on Vancouver Island, which is where I've lived for a very long time. Uh, so if you can find cold-smoked sockeye salmon, it only lives for two years. It doesn't get very much mercury. It doesn't get very much plastic in it. And it spends part of its life in fresh water, the lowest amount of microplastics. And you want to do that to get fish oil from it. But if you're saying, oh, I'm somehow holier than thou, so I'm going to be pescatarian, it's impossible to get one gram of fish protein per pound of body weight without filling your body with lead, mercury, and microplastics. So salmon is a once or twice a week thing. Grass-fed, grass-finished beef is a as much as you want it thing. Uh, those would be the two longevity proteins to look for the most. Got it. Awesome. Um, what about the eggs of said salmon? Does salmon eggs the list? would be in their own category. Hmm. In the world of, of fish oil, we've all heard fish oil, omega-3s are good for you. The vegans will tell you plant-based omega-3s work. They don't. You have to have 45 grams of plant-based omega-3s for your body to make one gram of the useful omega-3s if you can convert it, which would require having enough minerals. Oh, but you're vegan. You don't have enough minerals, so you're screwed. So what do we do? We either eat fish, which has some fish oil. When you eat fish, it's something called SN2 fish oil, which is the arrangement of atoms in the fish oil itself. You want EPA and DHA. And when you do that, you get a lot of benefits. But when you get salmon eggs called ikura, that is the most precious source of fish oil, EPA, and DHA. And the reason is that when it's in eggs, it's phosphorylated, which means it can cross the blood-brain barrier and be used directly in the brain. You're taking those oils partly to help mitochondria in your body, but mostly for your brain. About 15% of the fat in your brain is made of EPA and DHA, unless you don't eat it, in which case they'll get suppressed and they'll get replaced with omega-6 oils and your brain doesn't work as well. So the studies around Alzheimer's and cognitive function say you should have some fish oil, but not too much. And there are people who are, I'm going to say fish oil fetishists right now. And they're like, oh, I just drink half a bottle and you got to have it. You got to have it. It can cause your blood to be too thin it probably increases cancer risk when you're taking way too much for long periods of time because it's unstable, just like the other omega-6 oils. Um, the thing is you need some, but that doesn't mean you need a lot. So I like maybe up to four grams at the upper limit for most people. And if you were to get it through eating salmon eggs at the sushi place, these things are so precious that the indigenous people of North America, even when they were having tribal warfare, they, the people who had access to salmon would dry salmon eggs and trade them with the other tribes they were warring with because they knew their pregnant women needed to have these. They would save them as multivitamins for pregnancy to have healthier children. And I think the logic was we're at war right now, but we'll probably end up marrying half of their people anyway. So we might as well have healthy babies because we're going to be around for a long time. 
So Ikura Nigiri is what you should order if you want the healthiest thing. You can also buy krill oil, which is the same thing, or herring oil from a few companies. Those are superior to fish oil, which is itself superior to a manufactured product that you can get from algae, which is a similar form of fish oil. Adults need more EPA than DHA. Kids need more DHA than EPA. Mm, that is fantastic. All right, so on our list, let's count them down. We've got butter slash ghee. Olive oil was thrown in there a little bit as well. We've got blueberries, we've got animal proteins, we've got salmon roe. What's number five? Number five, you might think I'm biased. I, I am biased by the research only. It's coffee. The number of studies out there that correlate coffee with longevity. Like pick any medical condition you can think of, go to any search engine but Google. Google's not useful for medical stuff anymore. It's owned essentially by big pharma as far as I can tell. So go to DuckDuckGo or someone and just search for medical condition, coffee research, and just look at what you find. Like coffee helps your mitochondria directly. But there's something else people don't know about coffee. You might've heard about toxic mold in coffee. It's a major problem around the world. 30, uh, 36 studies support what I'm saying. I didn't pay for those studies. Most governments have regulations. The US does not have any regulations protecting us from mold in coffee, which is a known problem since the 90s. So when coffee is illegal to sell in Japan or China or South America, or Europe, they send it to the US and then we drink it and then we get cranky and jittery and angry and you know just yell at people and then need sugar and have another coffee later. This is why I created the mold-free coffee industry. It's why Danger Coffee is my new coffee brand. But there's something else I haven't talked about on podcast ever. You wanna know that one? Absolutely. Earlier we talked about oxalic acid and how these plant compounds build up. They cause kidney stones, they cause systemic pain and inflammation. And you can handle about 200 milligrams a day in your diet. But if you're eating oatmeal and nuts and seeds and grains and all these so-called healthy vegetables, by the way, some veggies are healthy. I'm not throwing all veggies under the bus. If you're eating those, you're probably getting five times the amount your body can handle and it builds up over time. So people go vegan two years later, like they were wrecked and then they stop being vegan. It takes them 10 years to recover. Well, green tea, which is supposed to be really, really healthy for you. It has a lot of benefits in longevity studies. It also has a lot of oxalic acid. So if you're drinking 10 cups of green tea a day, you're overloading your kidneys and other things with oxalate. Coffee has no oxalic acid in it naturally. It's safe from that. So the reason is green tea is protecting itself from bugs, partly with caffeine and partly with oxalate. Coffee is protecting itself from bugs with caffeine. And what that means is that when we drink it, caffeine up to 400 milligrams a day has beneficial effects on our biology. They're pretty well studied at this point too. Too much caffeine is not good for you, but some for most people, depending on your genetics, actually improves your performance in a, in a good way. 90% of the global population now drinks coffee for a reason. It's not because we're stupid. <laughs> so what are some of the unique compounds in coffee? that make it so special? Like what about antioxidants? Uh, well, coffee has two things in it that people don't think about. One of them is soluble fiber, prebiotic fiber. So if you're not using a paper filter, I don't recommend paper filters. Uh, if you're doing that, you get the coffee fines that just give more body to the cup of coffee. It tastes really good. Well, it turns out that feeds your gut bacteria. There's also the stuff that makes coffee dark and it's called polyphenols. And you've probably heard of melanin, right? <laughs> this is stuff that gives you darker skin. Well, there's also melanin behind your eyes and in your brain. And neuroscientists used to call it junk melanin because they didn't understand that one of the things melanin can do is it can convert sunlight or heat and vibration directly into electricity. So it's serving an electrical function in your skin. And this is why if you look at a 90 year old White person and a 90 year old darker skinned person who has the better skin and doesn't look like they aged. Black don't crack, Dave. Exactly. Black don't crack. He said it first. Uh, and so that's because melanin is actually a superpower. Biologically, it does stuff in the realms of quantum biology. So let's unpack what is melanin. Melanin is just cross linked polyphenols. What's in coffee? They're called melanoids, the precursors to melanin. So if you're drinking coffee, you're actually getting melanin levels that can be used inside your eyes where you can't see it. No ultraviolet light gets to the back of your eyeball where there's melanin and it gets into neural melanin, which is good for your brain. It's good for your biology. Coffee then also those polyphenols are a source of prebiotics. When you put 
prebiotic polyphenols in the gut, your gut bacteria flourish, the good ones flourish, and then they make beneficial compounds from them. So you just have a cup of good quality, mold-free black coffee and say, that's pretty good for you. But then people say, oh, no, no, I heard caffeine's a diuretic. It's an exceptionally weak diuretic, but moldy coffee is a strong diuretic because your body says, oh, ochratoxin A, that's really bad for kidneys and bladder. You ever drink a cup of bad coffee and then you really have to pee and you pee like half a cup? Like, why did you have to pee when your bladder wasn't full? It's your body going, get that shit out of me. It's bad for me. And if you drink good coffee, you have to pee and then your bladder's full. So this is your body protecting you from the toxins in coffee that are specifically bad for your kidneys and bladder. Yeah. And little not so fun fact, coffee is one of the most pesticide laden crops in, in our country as well. Uh, now, I'm going to ask you this because I, I bet people are wondering this very question. So, of course, there's like a you know longer term benefit on digestion with coffee, yep. with the polyphenols. But what about the instantaneous effect for some people? They have the sip of coffee and then it's like their cheeks are telling them to get to a bathroom quickly. What's going on there? So the instant disaster pants effect that happens uh, when you have coffee for some people, most people listening don't get it. Some people listening are getting it because it's the coffee they're drinking. <laughs> the body's like, get this out of here. This is not good for you. And other people, it is an effect of caffeine. It happens in a minority of people. You might find that having coffee with food will change that effect. And you may find that you're just sensitive to it, in which case you can drink something else. You might have a cup of green tea, but probably not 10 cups the way I used to like to. And if you're putting MCT oil and butter in your coffee the way I invented, Today, I use Danger Coffee. It's my, my new coffee. It has a large dose of trace minerals and electrolytes that are in it. So it tastes really good. You can't tell they're in there, but your body knows when you drink it. Because it has electrolytes, it hits your system very differently. And I haven't heard anyone tell me that Danger Coffee is causing this instant poop problem that they're getting from drinking dirty coffee. So I'm open to feedback on that. So I'll ask my audience as well. Like, hey guys, are you noticing a difference? What people do feel when there's the electrolytes that are in danger coffee is they feel a, a sense of clarity that comes on, I believe, and I don't have studies to support this, um, but I'm pretty good at figuring out biology, that because there's so many minerals and electrolytes, the body is allowing this to enter more quickly. Electrolytes do enter cells better. So the way that you just feel this like sense of grounding that comes from danger coffee is it's different than regular coffee. And I enjoy a mold-free regular coffee. I sometimes I'll buy real high-end coffee and try it. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I didn't drink that one. And sometimes like I found one that was pretty clean. And then, you know, it, it tastes something different. Um, to solve that problem of wanting variety, what I started doing is every couple of months, I'm making ceremonial grade danger coffee. And we go to micro lots, these tiny farmers, they might only make 2000 bags in the whole year. And this is like super premium wine, but it's coffee. And then we'll look at their cupping score, 86, 87. And then we test it with our lab testing to make sure it's mold free and quite often it's not. And then we re remineralize it with the process reason for danger coffee. And we send these out in these you know, special canisters uh, to subscribers. And it's ceremonial grade because it's coffee that's specifically meant for sharing with a friend. Mm -hmm. And you don't wanna just throw it in your coffee maker and rush off to work. It's, it's like, no, it's a weekend. Like I'm gonna make coffee for my family. I'm gonna have some friends over and you drink like, really good. Like if you were to go to a restaurant and you're celebrating new rays and you get, you know, a $500 bottle of wine or something, you don't drink it every day, but it's like, it's a special thing. So coffee is one of these things that it fueled the enlightenment in Europe. It's been a part of, of culture forever. Uh, people don't know this, but during World War II, we set up coffee roasters all over Europe just to make coffee for allied troops right? Because it was so important. Even going back to the Civil War, there were like riots over getting coffee to troops. So this is something that's just been a part of how we power our minds going back a very long time. And so just understanding the ritual and the richness of coffee culture and coffee history and being grateful and sharing it, I think it's a thousand times better for your brain than drinking wine. And I don't drink on a regular basis at all. It's very, very rare for me to have a drink like twice a year, maybe because of the longevity effects of alcohol, they're not good for you. 
Um, but coffee, I'll share it with someone. And I, I think it just deserves its own place in our culture. It's not a convenience food. It's not, you know, a 7-Eleven thing. Um, it's, a, it's a vital part of my morning ritual. So if you're rolling up to McDonald's for a McCafe, <laughs> you might be McFing yourself up. You know, it's hard to pick on McDonald's uh, for that. You can pick on them for the oils they use and other chemicals and, you know, mono their coffee quality in the last 20 years has gone through the roof i've still don't drink it but uh, uh, compared to 20 year old mcdonald's coffee they made great strides and what this is doing when you look at you know starbucks and mcdonald's and dunkin donuts you know, they're kind of in this war to see who's going to sell the most street grade coffee to people with the most sugar in it the most quickly right there is some aspect of some of those companies where they're trying to improve coffee quality and what that means is paying more to coffee growers, but they don't do that. Uh, what I do with Danger Coffee is I got, I'm buying straight from the grower. So they're getting a lot more money. And I look for uh, Rainforest Alliance certified or Fair Trade Alliance certified coffee. It's far more important than organic certification. Uh, you wouldn't know this in the coffee business, but organic coffee is only grown by large companies. Because the amount of money it takes to certify your farm to be organic is more than a small farm makes in a year. They can never do it. So you have to sell your farm, get rid of your ancestral lands, and live in a small apartment in a city so that the coffee plantation that your ancestors grew coffee on can be run by a big company and put an organic sticker and charge a dollar more per pound at wholesale. So I'd rather give that dollar per pound straight to that farmer. You stay on your land. And that just feels cleaner to me. I love that you called it street grade coffee, talking about <laughs> Starbucks and McDonald's. <laughs> um, you know, for the past 10 years now, you're at your 10 year anniversary, you've created the most iconic and the biggest biohacking event in the world. Oh, thanks, and man. you're at your 10 year anniversary. Congratulations on that. And it's it's just a it's a it's one of those things you truly have to experience. It is an absolute feast for your senses. You learn so much, the experiences. I think, I mean, time has flown by. I mean, it might have been five years ago that I spoke at the event. And the ten the tenth ten year anniversary event is coming up in a couple of months. End of May in Dallas. With this being said, I know that you personally have learned so much over this period. Oh, and I'm 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 assuming we didn't talk about this. I'm assuming. You're gonna be talking about what's happening right now in longevity and also what people can look forward to. So can you give us a little glimpse sure. into what that's gonna be? The theme of the 10th annual biohacking conference, it's at biohackingconference.com, obviously. <laughs> it's, uh, it's living beyond 180. And when I wrote my big longevity book, I talked about the fact that that wasn't an unreasonable goal. And we're bringing in the people who are doing that. Uh, Brian Johnson's uh, going to be presenting. But I'm also bringing in the other side of this that we don't talk about enough. And it's the, the spiritual side. Uh, Joe Dispenza is going to be talking about the science behind his work. So he's not going to be leading a bunch of breathwork stuff. You go to a Joe Dispenza event for that. And Joe's awesome. And I, I go to his events. And they're like transformational. Uh, he's going to be talking on stage potentially with one of the primary researchers from UCSD about the mitochondrial effects of meditation and mindset that are working better than pharmaceuticals. We're talking about studies of thousands of people with regular meditation practice with EEGs on their heads, measuring their saliva and measuring their poop and their blood. I mean, these are hardcore scientific studies showing that what you do with your breathing, what you do with your mindset, what you do with your heart actually affects longevity. It's causing changes in gene expression that are undeniable and that are better than pharmaceutical companies. And the thing is, you can't regulate meditation. So come to the biohacking conference. We're gonna teach you about that. And we're gonna teach you about uh, some of the other brain things. Uh, my dear friend, Dr. Daniel Amen, I'm on his board of directors for Amen Clinics, 20 plus years after his work changed my life and showed me I had a a hardware problem in my brain, not a moral failing, and it let me heal my brain. He'll be on stage to share his latest work. One of the more passionate guys I know. Uh, Dr. Mercola will be there, who's the most censored man in America, and always, every year, presenting the latest thing. He's kind of a little rabbit hole he's gonna run down. And uh, you'll hear stuff you've never heard before at this conference. First you, it was NWA, now Dr. Mercola. It, it's, it's all of it. Censored. <laughs> 
the the idea here is I just want people to be free. And if you want to be free, you got to have enough energy. And that means you got to have enough minerals, you got to have enough energy from food, and, and you have to have all the other micronutrients and not a lot of toxins break your energy. If you do that, your energy doesn't go into fear, it goes into overcoming fear. And it goes into overcoming cravings for hunger. And it goes into overcoming um, your desires that aren't serving you. And what's left is we're wired in our bones without thinking to be of service to our community and to our planet. So all you have to do is fill up your energy reserves and it brings you peace, but it also makes you dangerous because it, it's called danger coffee because who knows what you might do? There's, you have enough energy. So you're going to choose to be peaceful unless someone gets in your way. And then you're going to choose to, in a peaceful way, run right through them because they tried to keep you from getting the peptides that keep you feeling good, or they tried to limit your access to red meat or to grass-fed butter or any other nutrient you choose, including you want to live off you know, tofu balls? Good for you. You have a right to buy tofu balls. If anyone tries to stop you, if you have enough energy, you should stop them from stopping you, but I'm sorry, you won't have enough energy. So bottom line is, our job is to just feel so good all the time that it doesn't matter if it's your kids yelling at you, your boss yelling at you, or something on the TV yelling at you, or some non-elected governmental people trying to take over your government through treaties to force you to eat crickets and get um, medical procedures you don't want. Any of those kinds of hypothetical situations that, of course, have never happened. Any of those things, if you have enough energy, they're not your problem because they have no hold over you. And that's why it's called danger coffee, because what you're going to do is you're going to be awesome and you're not going to be programmable. And that's just the world I want to live in is full of people who choose peace because they can choose it. Amazing. Amazing. So the danger coffee is going to be flowing. Oh, yeah. We're going to have the greatest thinkers in longevity speaking. And also that you got a bunch of different workshops as well oh, yeah, that are more intimate and people can get information on the event. One more time to biohackingconference.com. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I don't want to let you go without asking you about this because it was sandwiched in to this, <laughs> Can't wait. This, what, what this, this? Uh, this submarine sandwich that we've had here today. You mentioned alcohol. Yep. All right. A lot. It, and Daniel Amen really changed my perspective on he, this. He's, substantially. he's a man with the research. Yeah. But now there yeah. are so many different areas of, of health that are speaking out about this, but in particular, people who are in the neuroscience space, really bringing more attention to some of the ramifications of drinking alcohol. Can you talk a little bit about that? There's two things that are going to trigger people a lot when I say, you know, this probably isn't really good for you. One of them is alcohol. The other one's ejaculation. Damn. And they usually go together. I, exactly. So uh, uh, truly... Look, they both feel good. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I'll just tell you that if you choose not to do it very often, your quality of life, your desire for life, uh, and the length of your life, it, they all improve. It only takes one drink to ruin your sleep, and we know anyone who has a sleep tracker, just go out there and have a glass of really good red wine, and look at what your sleep score is. It's not going to be good. There's no way around that. You can do something called Z-Biotic. That was the thousandth episode of my show. It's the first genetically engineered probiotic that helps you metabolize alcohol. That'll help a little bit. You take fistfuls of glutathione, it'll help a little bit. End of the day, if you stack everything in your, in your direction and you have a few glasses of wine, you're gonna wake up the next morning and go, I feel okay, but you don't feel great. And if you look at your data, like, oh man, my heart rate variability dropped by 10 points. Huh, it's almost like alcohol is bad for me because it is. And if you look at... Daniel Amen's work, he's got almost a half a million brain scans now, maybe a little bit more than that. And he wrote a very famous book that changed my life. It's called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. When he looks at alcohol, he says, here's people who drink one drink a night and their brains have metabolic holes in them. Here's people who don't drink and they don't have it. So sorry, I want alcohol to be good for you. So what do you do? Kava <laughs> in the South Pacific uh, you can use a traditional plant medicine that activates GABA receptors like alcohol. So it's got the smooth social feeling and it's not very buzzy like alcohol, but it doesn't make you aggressive and it doesn't give you a hangover and it's actually good for your brain cells. I use a brand called True Kava. I've actually helped them get into um, Sprouts recently and I've been advising them because they're doing lab tested 
kava to make sure that it's clean. There was a time in the 80s where people were selling species of kava you shouldn't actually consume. So there, there were issues with liver toxicity, but like this is just a, a third party validated brand. And what I do in my part is, is I, I say, hey guys, can you send me a few, either a keg or a few uh, cases of true kava? And I put that out. And yeah, there's a bottle of tequila if people want it, but at least where I am in Austin, I got more people drinking kava at parties. Like if you're under 35, like, yeah, okay, maybe I'll have some alcohol, but the kava's like, all right, I'll do that. And they're much more likely to have a microdose and a true kava than they are alcohol. And the alcohol industry is freaking out because young people are like, no, it's not that it's wine or beer. Like, I don't want either one. And like, well, what do we do? What do we do? And well, what you should do is probably stop making alcohol such an industry. So deeply ingrained into everything yeah. though, Dave, yeah. that's a quite undertaking, but you know, it's just important just to understand it's an, it's inherently toxic. That's what it's, yeah. that's what it does It's some of yeah. the effects that you experience from that. And also our body doesn't store alcohol, no. right? It's one of those things where it's coming in, your body's like shifting everything over possible using that in trying to get rid of it. And there's this phenomenon mm. called fat sparing <clears throat> that takes place where all the, all the attempts at burning the stored fat that a lot of people want to do all that shuts down. Your body mm -hmm. focuses on, we've got to get this alcohol out of our system. It's funny. There's one time alcohol is good for you. You ever see those old videos of like a, a St. Bernard with a little collar with a barrel of rum? Yeah. Why is it rum? Well, what they're doing, it might've been brandy. I don't know, some kind of alcohol. But what they're doing is if you drink alcohol, your body immediately stops burning sugar and stops burning fat because it has to burn the alcohol first because it's toxic. It's just, how do I get this crap out of here? So if you're in a hypothermic state and you drink alcohol, it's gonna cause a wave of mitochondrial respiration that will heat up your tissues. This is why some people get flushed, not the flushing that Asian people experience because they don't have liver enzymes, but people just get like a burst of energy from the first drink or two. It's because you're getting a little short-term mitochondrial boost. It could save you if you're freezing to death. So if you're in that situation, have a couple drinks on me. Otherwise, don't do it because there's just other compounds that are better for your brain, better for your social interactions. And you won't wake up one day with Alzheimer's, cancer, heart disease, and looking really old because you had a healthy couple of glasses of wine every night. That's what happens. If you don't believe me, go to PubMed and look at the studies. Hmm. You just changed my life. I just rolled back to my cartoon watching days, <laughs> watching Looney Tunes, yes, yes, how many one. low key, like they had the dog with the barrel around his yeah, neck. That's why. Come on, man. Yeah, there's a reason. And first of all, those cartoons were a little bit spicy back then. All kinds of stuff oh, were in them. Do you know Pepe Le Pew was definitely like, he needed to chill. He, he would definitely would have been brought to yeah, he'd have been HR canceled. for sure. Yeah, It gets a little bit worse thinking about Mighty Mouse. Oh, not Mighty Mouse. Now, there's two of them that we got to talk about real quick here. I know this is what you thought we'd talk about. So Mighty Mouse got canceled in the early 80s because there was an episode where you know he's a normal mouse and he turns into Mighty Mouse. He snorted a line of white powder and became... Bro. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's no. why you don't see Mighty Mouse anymore. No. And no. they asked the, the the illustrators, and they're like, it was ground up flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. Of course it was. This is real. That's what they did to write Mighty Mouse. Uh, that's what they did to write Mighty Mouse. And then you got Popeye. You think that was spinach? Mm. That was testosterone. Come on. He was juicing. He Come wasn't on. juicing spinach. That's all I'm saying. Man. <laughs> Dave, this has been an adventure, man, as, as usual. And I appreciate you so much. Thank you for sharing your passion, your insights. And of course, you mentioned where people can get tickets to the event, uh, Danger Coffee. Is there anything else you want to share where yeah. people can come and connect with you, I social just, media? I just redid DaveAsprey.com. Awesome. Okay. So it's got all 3,000 articles, 1,200 podcasts, and a bunch of other free info and all that stuff just organized so you can find things. I just, there's so much there. I'm also about to launch an AI model. I had to custom build it. I've written too much to put into ChatGPT. So I'm building my own model that has everything I've ever said, ever written, all of my research library, so that I can help people get to the root of what works for them Instead of saying, just do what I do, don't do what I do. What I do is I test things that should work. I see if they do work and I do more of those. And I want to teach people to do that. I don't think you can follow any one protocol. Don't eat what I eat. Eat what works for you using the same principles that I use. It's a very different idea than following a specific regiment that someone else follows. I don't think you're going to get the results you want. I never did. All right. We can't leave anybody hanging on this one, by the way. 
you mentioned earlier, just in closing, I got to get this in here. I want to make sure I put a little note not to miss this. You you mentioned EJAC. All right, you so, mentioned so the EJAC. EJAC you said you want, to, you want me to leave you hanging in the same sense? <laughs> I was thinking of the all kinds of puns. I was trying to say it in a way that didn't just blatantly. But how is that correlated with longevity? It turns out that in Taoism, they were studying immortality. They were looking for ways to extend human life so that you could live for hundreds of years. And there's some evidence that a few of them probably achieved that. And probably more evidence than there is for blue zones, uh, to be honest. But one of the most important practices was just for men. And it was following a specific equation. You can have as many orgasms as you want, but don't ejaculate each time you have an orgasm. And most men don't know this. And it's been really transformative for me about... 15 years ago, I learned these techniques because I was trying to disprove the equation. And the equation for men looks like this. It's age in years minus seven divided by four. So how old are you? Uh, 44. So 44 minus seven is 38. 38 divided by four, it's about nine, right? So that means you ejaculate once every nine days or less and that you're gonna maintain your health. But they also said, if you wanna live forever, for men only, ejaculate not more than once every 30 days and keep the length of your orgasm to less than an hour. Now, that's what I said. I, I was like, what? This is impossible. It's BS. And I love biohacking because we're proving so much ancient wisdom with data. Like, actually, they weren't crazy. Acupuncture is real. Breath work is real. Meditation is real. So I said, I got to disprove this because I hate it. And I went for a year. I published all my data on the blog. Um, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. I tried to go 30 days, but you know, day 22, oops, you know, I got to start that experiment over again. And there's a very clear orgasm hangover for men, or more to be, to be really straightforward, an ejaculation hangover for men. The day after you ejaculate, you don't like your job as much. You don't like your partner as much. You don't like your life as much. And the reason for this is a hormone called prolactin. So when you ejaculate, your prolactin levels soar, and this causes essentially the orgasm hangover. The, will you respect me in the morning thing? No, because my prolactin levels are high and they hack my brain and make me just, I'm lower dopamine, things are not as good. I didn't know this, I didn't recognize this, but I tracked my daily happiness for a year. I ran the 30 day experiments multiple times and I ran the ejaculate whenever you want. And what you'll find is really straightforward if you have a regular partner. The less you ejaculate, the more you make love. Makes sense. Like, I'm ready to go again. Can we go again? And because you're not focused on ejaculating, like, can we just go for two hours this time? And like, since I know I'm not going to ejaculate today, what else am I going to do? I'm going to make her come over and over and over until she can't speak. And so part of the part of the difficulty for me is I, I scoured the literature. In Taoism, all they say is a woman walks away undiminished. So I calculated the ideal number of orgasms and frequency for women. And it took a lot of research, but I finally got it. And it's the number of orgasms until the woman feels like she's going to die plus two. <laughs> that's, that's where we got to close it. That's where we got to close it. <laughs> Dave Asbury, my guy, thank you so much for sharing your, your genius. That is crazy, man. Amazing, amazing. And again, one more time for the event. Go to biohackingcommerce.com. You might hear me talk about that last little hint. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Starting about in our mid to late 20s, we start losing about 1% of the thickness of our collagen every year. And so really focusing on the collagen is a huge part of slowing down that aging process when you're looking at the skin 